Albert, uh, where, in, uh, where were you born? Brooklyn, New York. Okay. 1937. Okay. Did you have any formal art training? I uh, studied at the Art Students League of New York. On Saturdays, I studied with somebody who's not well known and died young. His name was Louis Priscilla, but he studied with George Bridgman. So, in a, in a way, I had a secondhand George Bridgman education, and I really valued it. And one summer, I uh, studied for a month or two with a sculptor, uh, Robert Ward Johnson. Again, not too well known. But he taught me about cross-contour lines uh, emphatically. You know, he was a sculptor, and uh, I never forgot that. And I'm thankful uh, to both these men for uh, teaching me a lot about drawing. Right. Do you remember an event, or was it a series of events that led you to fine art? Well, illustration collapsed. Um, when I was younger, I used to like getting uh, Collier Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, and see uh, Norman Rockwell and Harold Van Schmidt and uh, others uh, like that who were illustrators who I thought were painters. And uh, when I was getting to be 20, 21 years old, in uh, 57, 58, uh, they had changed that type of uh, illustration to more photography and patterns and stuff like that. And that wasn't my dream. So I was kind of scratching my head until a friend of mine said I ought to go into fine arts. And I said, what's fine arts? I said, well, you, you paint whatever you want to paint and then you sell the pictures. And I thought that was kind of funny. Because uh, uh, Brooklyn is pretty provincial, and uh, uh, I always thought uh, it was a great idea that uh, somebody wanted a specific type of painting, and I had a job, so to speak, and I more or less did it. Turns out that I'm built totally differently than that, and they had to explain to me what fine arts was, and uh, I went to the Village Outdoor Art Show. And there were some good uh, students who were students of Dumont, Frank Vincent Dumont, who had passed away. And uh, Frank Mason had taken over his uh, position at the league. And I liked uh, what I saw uh, hanging on those uh, fences down in the village. And I spoke to them and uh, I ended up studying with Frank Mason for two years. And I'm kind of thankful for that. Right. Uh, did you start painting oils or pastels first? Um, well, here's an irony. <clears throat> uh, sometimes people call pastels chalks. When I was five, six, seven years old, I was a, I was an overly protected child. A little embarrassed about that, but in any event, I was. And uh, there was a candy store downstairs, and in there, I, for two cents, I could buy three pieces of white chalk, and for a nickel, mm -hmm. I could buy three or four colors, and I just uh, sat around and drew, and drew, and drew, and drew, and people patted me on the head and said I was an artist, and I certainly needed that as a kid. And... Um, uh, I had a tendency towards it back then uh, when I actually started uh, learning how to paint, so to speak, it was all with oils. So the idea of working with pastels was nowhere at all in my mind. As a matter of fact, I don't touch a pastel until after I've been painting with oils for nine or ten years and I come back from uh, Europe. I spent four years in Europe. Interesting is and they were good years. A uh, bit lonely, but with the loneliness, um, those tapes, you should do this and you should do that, and all this confusion that can come on with uh, suggestions or whatever you want to call them, uh, kind of drifted off as I got into my thing. An example, 
uh, you should work with a big brush. Well, I like to work with small brushes. You should work opaquely. Well, I like to work transparently. You know, <laughs> there were a lot of little things like that that I had to work out, and uh, I did. Just touching back on Europe a bit, how did that influence your uh, um, your future after that, your art journey? How did what happened there? Well, um, I was alone for four years, and like I say, I uh, wasn't uh, influenced by friends, so to speak, and uh, I had time to spend by, my, by myself. Um, I, um, I thought I liked the old masters, you know, Rembrandt, Titian, Velazquez, etc., 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 and I found I like Bouillard, I, uh, somebody who I would never thought of. Uh, I um, like more and more the artists from 1850 to 1930. I sensed that the best artists I knew were in New York City, uh, Bert Silverman, Harvey Dennison. Uh, I met Richard Schmidt early on. Uh, he came from Chicago. Uh, uh, Dave Levine, Aaron Schickler. I, th I thought the best painters that I knew were my friends. So um, that was an eye-opener. And I got to know the museums exceptionally well. And I had all sorts of thoughts about things. I don't remember names all that well. But I remember going to Italy and looking at works from the 1400s, or let's say 1500s. And then I'd go up to the lowlands, uh, Belgium or Holland, and see works from the 1600s. And there was a certain type of quietness in both places. And then when I looked at works from the 1700s, it seemed like it got quicker and noisier. Then the 1800s got quicker and noisier yet. And I had some theories about the environment. Uh, I never liked cars. Um, I nearly moved to Venice because <laughs> there's no cars. Uh, I had all sorts of notions. Uh, I had some things to work out uh, as a young man. And um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Does it? Yeah. Um, about how old were you when you felt that your work uh, that you were doing is getting closer to your vision? Well, <clears throat> uh, I was always an indoor painter and I always liked being outdoors. Uh, seems like I get antsy after three, four months of working indoors. I just uh, had to change things. I'm still that way. Um, I used to paint every single day. Uh, a week for me would be 14 days, 13 and a half days painting, and the other half a day, a Sunday would go to the museum. I mean, there was no two ways about it. And um, I would work very intensely for like three, four months, and then the, the well would be empty. I just didn't want to paint. So I would draw. I like to draw. I started. I I started drawing before I started painting. So I always had a an affinity and a respect for just just drawing. And it would take a few weeks. I also like to play chess and stuff like that. And uh, slowly but surely the the well would fill up again and I'd start painting again. Well, one time when I came back from Europe, uh, 68, 69, something said to me, pastel. I don't know where it came from, but something said pastel. So I called up my friends, they, they worked the pastels. One said, get marble dust boards. The other one said, get, uh, 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 cancel papers or whatever they said and I started experimenting and something very interesting happened right then and there. 
Oils is a glossy uh, medium, and you can lower the key and get very resinous colors, nice and dark. And the way I was painting, if you went too high in key, uh, one was told to look chalky, wasn't resinous enough. Well, pastel is just the opposite. You can stay very high in key and have the most gorgeous colors, and you fight like hell to bring it down. And I tried to twist the medium as if I was working with oils, which was impossible to do, but was interesting because it's, it, it shattered everything. And here I was now an experienced painter. I had been painting nine, ten years, whatever it is. So uh, I wasn't a beginner by any means. And here I was beginning with a whole new world. And I knew something special was happening, but I felt a little bit too guilty about things because I had this notion that oils counted and pastels didn't count. And when I had uh, a New York show at the ACA gallery, which is a major gallery, I had the large room, which had the oils, and I had this smaller room that had these pastels. And though I, I sweated it out. I couldn't accept the idea that I liked the works in the smaller room to the big room. And um, John Koch, spelled K-O-C-H, uh, was a very successful and a wonderful artist. And um, he bought one of the pastels and um, the, the, the guy, Bob Sutton or other, who worked there was a writer. And he called up Watson and Guptu because he knew Watson and Guptu was reissuing a book, um, How to Paint with Pastel Step by Step, or something by Eleanor Lathrop Sears. And the editor came down, Don Holden, and he flipped out. And he said, would you like to be in the book? So, uh, you don't say no to that. And all my friends, there they were, Schickler, Dan Green, uh, Silver. And um, I, uh, I was in the book, and I felt terrific about things. And um, the pastels, for me, made sense, artistic sense in a way. That surprised me, delighted me, and uh, it was unpredictable, and uh, it was an experience. And I loved it. And for me, that was the beginning of a voyage that I'm still on. And um, the difference, in my opinion, between somebody who paints well and who's an artist is something obsessive. In other words, um, when I'm dealing with trees, uh, I, I can't see the sky. I can't, you know, it's, uh, it's trees. To such a point <clears throat> that when I was in Woodstock, New York, I was seeing the Eddie Duchin story. I think that's how you say his name. And he was walking in Central Park telling his wife that cancer has come back and he's going to die. And I'm looking at the trees in the background. And uh, soon afterwards, I went down to Florida to visit my mom. But I realized how obsessive and intense uh, that interest was. And I've been following my, my instincts. Um, uh, I come from an intuitive place. Uh, uh, if I I, uh, some artists know what the picture should kind of look like, and you just get there. I get excited by something, and I jump in, and then I, um, I go through a process that I don't recommend, but that's a process that I work with, and it becomes uh, uh, an experience. Uh, Sometimes 
uh, I could start a picture and nothing happens with it after a point. Other times, it, it has a freshness to it that I'm delighted with. So somewhere in this here a way of working, which was unor unorthodox as far as I was concerned, uh, something happened that uh, made me realize that I was me. How have you seen representational art change in the last 50 years? Oh, dramatically. Um, uh, 50 years ago, uh, uh, let's see, uh, in 1957, that might be a little bit more than 50 years ago, 55, whatever it was, um, nobody cared one iota about drawing. Uh, the attitude in the universities was, why bother? It's, it's already been done. I kept telling him, well, I haven't done it yet, but I'm glad it's been done. But, you know, we used to actually hide in the closet, so to speak. When I was down in Greenwich Village drawing a lot, you know, there's a lot of romantic things going on down in the village, you can imagine. And... Um, being sociable and all that, uh, things would be going fine. And they'd say, oh, you're a painter. I said, oh, yes, I am. And then they'd say, uh, well, what do you do? I said, well, I paint realistically. And they would just uh, look at me like, gee, my knees, where did this guy come from, you know? So uh, we knew each other. Um, there was um, a co-op called the Davis Gallery. And there was a co-op called the Fitzgerald Gallery down by McSorley's Ale House, literally next door. And um, on 7th, East 7th Street. And um, they're mostly all guys. The guys in the Davis Gallery were eight or ten years older than us guys, <laughs> us juniors. And they were Dave Levine, Aaron Sheckler, Bert Silverman, Harvey Dent, you know, it's the same name. And, but we had Nelson Shanks next to, with us, and uh, there were some other good youngsters coming up, and um, we just all knew each other. And there was just one or two galleries you could exhibit in, Grand Central Art Gallery, uh, Forum Gallery, there were the Sawyer brothers, Raphael and Moses Sawyer. Um, there was this uh, Japanese-American guy, Ben Kamihara. I think I'm saying his name right. But, and John Koch, who's a wonderful one. But it was like a minority group, literally. So uh, now uh, drawing is really appreciated. What I appreciate a lot about uh, the Florence Academy and all the other academies like that, that uh, uh, ha in my opinion have Bouguereau on a very high uh, esteem, which is fine with me, is uh, they, they know how to measure. They simply know how to measure and Measuring and relating, another fancy way to say measuring, is the basis of good drawing, is one of the basis, and it didn't exist. It was really crazy back then. Uh, the universities were useless, in my opinion. The Art Students League was a saving grace, but um, now people value drawing and they have learned to draw. And um, um, this tight, uh, very academic painting, I respect. It takes a certain amount of uh, ability. Uh, it's not my painting. I don't want to paint that way, but I respect it. It didn't exist at all. Um, Frank J. Riley existed, and to us it was uh, uh, Western magazine covers. Back then, and I don't agree with this now, but back then, you know, you're 19, so whatever they feed you goes right in there, right into your belly. Right back then, amongst us who painted realistically, there was like something etched in the, in the ground. 
If you work from a photograph, you're an illustrator. If you work from life, you're a fine artist. Well, of course, I wanted to be a fine artist. So I wouldn't dream of working from a photograph. And I didn't work from a photograph for 18 or 19 years. And when I started working from a photograph, because I was working outdoors, and actually uh, it's a great aid, I felt very guilty for a very long time. Finally got over that notion, but I was amazed how it got inside of me and, um, and kind of governed me, if you wish. Um, my feeling is if you're working um, honestly from life, Especially landscape now. I've, I've never done a portrait from a photograph. Isn't that interesting? But working from photography for me is very simple. One, I used to work in black and white photographs. That's interesting. Two, um, if you came to my studio and saw the painting I was working on, you wouldn't believe that it came from that photograph. But without that photograph, there's no painting. So for me, in my opinion, what the photograph does is excites something inside of me and gets me going. And like I say, my pictures are an adventure. They're not uh, an alphabet, you know, A to Z. Matter of fact, uh, in my opinion, uh, there's no Z in this alphabet. Uh, uh, what's a finished painting? Hmm. Um, when you're tired of working on it, I guess it's finished. Uh, when you have a certain amount of beauty that justifies its, uh, its existence, uh, it's res um, it deserves to, to live. I mean, uh, there is something called resolving a painting, but you don't want to take away the beauty that you have as you resolve it. I mean, what are you resolving? You're killing. You're overworking. You're really finishing it <laughs> in a big way. <laughs> so um, it's been an interesting question, uh, and I've um, I've laid it out on the line with that. I'll give you an example. If you have a toned background and you do part of a picture, it's fine. But if you have a white background and you do the same part of the picture, hey, that's no good. Why? Why is it no good? it doesn't have a tone, you know? It's, um, uh, so uh, I said, well, the heck with the tone. I'm gonna do it on a white background or a light background. And um, there was some criticism and um, um, what can you say? But I learned about shapes, undeniable shapes. Because when it's on white, it screams when it's on a, middle tone thing, it just floats in and out. Well, I'm not, uh, and um, there was another thing with this here toned background and things in and out. It, it would relate a lot to the shadows. The shadows would kind of sleepily go away into the background, which, which is nice. But when you work on a white uh, tone, uh, it stands out. It doesn't go to sleep so fast. Um, I don't know. And I started to like to work in, in flat light where there's very little shadow. And for me, when they're in flat light, there's more of a play of color. And then working with pastel, uh, there's such luscious colors, uh, very luscious. Um, you know what I actually did one time? I did a pastel on location, and then in the studio I tried to copy it with oils to see if I can get the same colors. And it was amazing uh, seeing, uh, for me, the difference of the two mediums. I was able to pull off a beautiful painting from the pastel, but not getting all those colors, but by getting more of a textual quality. So I started to realize by shifting from one medium to the other medium, uh, the uniquenesses for me about the two mediums. It's been an interesting trip. What advice can you give a young aspiring painter? 
um, try, do get an education. Uh, I think uh, the Florence Academy types of learning is very good for drawing. Excellent. I highly recommend it. Beware. You can go too far with it, and that's it. Or you can go to a certain point and make use of it. And that's tricky for a youngster. If you can sense who you are, never lose sight of that as you study whatever. If you're not clear about that, and it's hard to expect a 22-year-old to be clear about that, uh, do, do experiment. Uh, see how easy or difficult it is to paint large. See how easy or difficult it is to paint small. See how easy or difficult it is to paint strictly from life. See how easy or difficult it is to start a painting from life and then finishing it away from life. Uh, I'll give you an example. I used to know anatomy inside out and backwards. I loved the back view. As soon as I saw the front view and I saw the person's face, they, they just as well get dressed because the face really interests me. Not the hands, not the, <laughs> the face. And also, um, uh, though I love women, no two ways about it, I prefer painting a man. Uh, I like um, the solidity uh, the, f the form, the weight of a man. A, w a woman has gorgeous curves, let's say. I mean, they have weight, but, uh, you know, it's that. A guy is uh, a little bit more... Uh, I always had... Uh, this is interesting. I always had a great... a better sense of weight than I did of proportion. And I have a whole thought about that. If you're very good at proportion, there's a tendency of a flatness. If you struggle with proportions, you have a tendency to get uh, volume. I'm serious about that. And, uh, well, at least I'm talking about myself for sure. Forget the rest of the world. I had a, uh, a feeling for weight better than proportion. I had to struggle with the proportion, but the sense of uh, form uh, and you take something like that. Well, I liked working on squares. Well, when you think of shapes to work on, and you think in a form, well, a square. <laughs> You're not going to do a, a horizontal or, or a rectangle, you know. That's for something else. But if you want something zopchik, as they would say, you know, uh, meaty, a square is perfect. Now, a lot of people hate working on squares. I loved it. So, um, and I always had a little bit of a weight problem, so I don't know how much of this is a, is a self-portrait or something unconsciously, but in any event, that's all I can think of that. Okay. If you could go back in time, which artist would you like to meet? Or a group of artists, maybe. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't mind spending some time with Edouard Bouillard. I wouldn't mind spending time with John Singer Sargent and uh, Sorolia and company. I really like uh, Hassam's work very, very much. But uh, I, th I, I thought his works are just beautiful. Um, no, let's say those four or five people. Good enough. Thank you, Albert. Oh, you're welcome.